I'm Kelly Powers from Creative Catalyst Productions. I sat down with Linda Baker after the production of her DVD workshop, Layers of Design in Watercolor, to discuss her life, career, and art. In part two of our two-part interview, Linda talks about pricing work, getting into galleries, entering shows, and much more. Linda Baker's DVD, Layers of Design in Watercolor, is available now at ccpvideos.com. How do you price your work? When it comes to pricing a reproduction or a giclée, you want to think about the end result. You don't want to just have one giclée printed and say, oh, my friend wants to buy it, and so I'm going to sell it to him for $25. When you do that, you want to think, maybe I'm going to end up in the giclée business, and maybe I better think about this ahead of time. So you might think, well, if I were going to end up in the giclée business, first off, there's no point in doing one and going through all of that effort if you're not going to be in the giclée business. So if that friend says, I really like that, say, hmm, that's not going to be my focal point. I'm not going to do that. But if you think, well, I could make some money in here and I have some images that are worth reproducing, you want to think down the road a little bit. So if your giclée is offered in a gallery, that gallery is going to take 50% of it. If you have to have an agent to sell it around to these different galleries, they're going to take half. So on things like that, you can almost assume that you're going to end up with 25% of the retail price. And out of that 25%, you're going to create it, paint it, and sometimes package it and ship it. So if you sell it to your friend for $25, and then the gallery said, well, I'll put a few of these in here for $25, and you think, oh, that's wonderful. But you're only going to get $12.50 out of it because they have already taken half. And then if you realize that you might have to ship it or shrink wrap it or mat it or something like that, well, now pretty soon you're down to a very small percentage. So you want to think ahead. Originals are a different story. In the early years when I was painting things that are pretty similar in quality, I priced my work by the inch. So if I had a 22 by 30, it was 660 square inches. And if I charged $600 for it, it was so much per square inch. So if I did a small size, I just multiplied it out. And that was easy, just to do it by square inch. And I do by square inch because I do a lot of funky sizes, a little long skinny one, a square one, a lot of odd formats that I select. So I did it by the square inch. As I started getting some accolades, as my work started to develop more personally, you get paintings that are much better than the last painting that you painted. Or you're teaching workshops and you do a demo and that's not near the quality. So now my work goes for prices all over the map. It's not based on size. Sometimes it's based on how strong of a painting it was. If I've had a breakthrough painting, I don't sell them. I've kept all my breakthrough paintings for myself. When I turned a corner, my very first clothespin painting, I realized that was gonna be important to me and I have kept it. And I've had quite a few offers to buy it for a pretty good price tag. But that one I've kept. I kept my first award winner just because it mattered to me. And it's not that great a painting. It was just my first award winner. So now my prices are all over the place. If it wins a national award, then the price goes up a little bit. If it wins a very significant national award, the price goes up quite a bit. So now I base it on quality, not quantity. What is the symbolism in your paintings? I can talk about the clothespin series. Because I was doing laundry one day, this basket of clothespins fell off my dryer onto the floor, and I thought, oh, shoot. And I went, turned around to pick them up, and the sun was streaming through the window, and I said, oh, wow. The abstract qualities for me were just huge. I like taking sort of ordinary subject matters and taking them almost to the point of abstraction. I like it if when you look at my work, it takes you just a moment to realize what it is almost the way a camera would focus in. Like you look at something and you might think it's an abstract, and then you go, oh, it's clothespins, or oh, it's gears, oh, it's antique locks, this kind of thing. And I like a lot of pattern and repetition. So when I saw these things laying on the floor and I saw that abstract quality and the sun just dancing over top of them, I was all taken with that. Ran and got my sketchbook, got my camera, and no laundry that day, no laundry. So then I started painting them, and of course the photos were terrible. They're just tan clothespins in a tan basket. There's nothing there. And I thought, okay, what am I going to show here? And I asked a couple of my friends again. I've done this periodically, and they said the same thing they always say to me. I don't see it, Lenny. Mm -mm, I don't think so. <laughs> but I saw it. And so this is sort of an interesting story how I painted my first clothespin. We had a little bit of a lull in our life, which is pretty rare. And I said to my husband, I have got a whole bunch of unfinished paintings. I have like 30 unfinished paintings. I've got shows coming up, galleries that are calling for paintings. I said, I would like to go up to this friend's cottage 
no TV, no phone, no nothing. I would like to go up there for two weeks, count them, two weeks, by myself uh, and paint and finish this off. He's like, go ahead. So I went up to my friend's cottage with all 30 paintings, fully intending to finish those paintings. One big old bag of junk food, couple novels, and my paintings. So the very first day, pull all my paintings out and look at them. But in the corner of my mind, I'm thinking, I brought those photographs and sketches of these clothespins. I just couldn't get that out of my head, and I thought, I'll just sketch on them for a little bit. And true to my form, I don't pick a little small piece of paper. I decide I'm going to do it on a double elephant piece of paper, 30 inches by 42 inches. Big old honking piece of paper. So I spend the entire first week drawing it, working it out, working out the composition, sketching, drawing, doing all this kind of stuff on this big old giant piece of paper. Get it the way I want it, and I think to myself, I think I'll just put a little wash over this. Well, that's where I learned my first lesson on pouring. I pick this tube of paint, it's this huge piece of paper, so squirt this big old glob of paint in my bin, wash it all up, and throw it over the whole painting. And the minute I do, I'm like, Oh my gosh, what have I done? It looked completely opaque. The first thing I realized is I didn't see my drawing at all. It was gone. <laughs> so I ran and got, uh, I took it outside and I ran and got a bucket of water and went whoosh right over it. That didn't do it. I got, <laughs> there's a garden hose. I got this garden hose over here. <laughs> Hit it. I even put it in her whirlpool bathtub. And so here this piece of paper is nearly mutilated. I can't find my drawing. I spent another day re-establishing my drawing and then started masking my layers. Well, I couldn't find my way in the clothespins because they all look too much alike, very mechanical, all those little bits and pieces. So I thought, I'm gonna do them different colors. That's how I'm gonna figure them out. I'm gonna paint a clothespin one color and another clothespin another color. So there came the color into it. So the very first clothespin painting that I did, and needless to say, two weeks up there, what did I come home with? Ray said, how did you do? Did you get them all done? I said, I did one. He said, one? What about your galleries? I said, let me show it to you. And when I showed it to him, he said, oh my goodness. <laughs> so that painting was the first time I entered National Watercolor Society and shipped that big giant painting out there and it took a nice high award. So I thought I'll try it in American Watercolor Society. It was my first time into American Watercolor Society. It took a high wins medal. It's been in four shows, it's won four awards, it's retired, and it hangs in my family room. And that was all about abstraction, color, the pins, the shape, and then I thought, okay, what about a clothespin? And I realized it was a huge symbol. It's like internationally iconic, the clothespin. Every nation, no matter what language you speak, in England they call them pegs, in the Orient they call them clips, so I realized that they were very symbolic. And then I thought about what you use them for. This is women's work. A clothespin is known really as traditional women's work. So then I did uh, a series of them. I did one painting with the clothespins over top of the Wall Street Journal. And it says things like city manager and banker and called it domestic headlines. And this was my nod from the domestic world of women's work to the corporate world of women's work. And where did that fit? And on that one, I made the clothespins almost float so it looked kind of surreal because it is a surreal transition that women have made, I think, through time and in our society. And then I did one with clothespins and apples in the basket, and I called it In the Beginning. And this was my nod to Adam and Eve. <laughs> and the women's work and the don't eat the apple and sort of the all-American apple pie, so the whole thing. Alex Powers said to me, nobody will ever get that concept. Nobody's gonna get that content. Catherine Chang Lu said, I did, I gave it an award. <laughs> So there you have it, you know. Uh, so some of them are about color, some of them are about design. The one that I did of Shadow Dance is in this S composition, and the composition for me is so strong that it almost doesn't even let you out of the painting, the way the pins are arranged. So for me, they're about all kinds of things, but yes, there's symbolism, there is history, there's patina, there's women's work, there's everything in there for me. So for me, it's been a strong series. And who would know? A little clothespin. What advice would you give to someone just starting out in art? I think I would tell them to keep it simple. Limit your palette. Learn about colors. Limit your subject matter. Don't just paint a barn and then paint your dog and then paint your grandkids and then try some abstract thing. Take workshops to learn. Get books to learn. But don't take them with the idea that you're going to become that artist. 
take them with the idea that this artist is going to teach me a whole new bag of tricks and I'm going to be able to come home and incorporate it into my style. I think artists that take a workshop and sort of get enamored with the way that artist works forgets to come home and put it into their own bag of tricks. So I would say stay open. And I would say don't expect too much of yourself and enjoy the journey. It's not about the destination, it's about the journey. Enjoy making art, enjoy finding subjects to paint, enjoy the photographing, enjoy the sketching, enjoy the fact that you just drew this thing and it doesn't remotely look like anything you hoped it would. And you turn the page and it starts over, it's a brand new day. Linda, what are your influences, living or dead? I like lots of artists and I like lots of kinds of work. Uh, in the beginning, I was very enamored with Monet and the Impressionistic. And when I started out painting my florals and doing porches and things, I think I wanted to be more of an Impressionistic painter than a photorealism, even though I was using realistic subject matter. An artist that has really spoke to my mind through all of my years and even back into college is Andrew Wyeth. I love sort of the homespun way he tells a story. I love the way he puts a composition together. In his Christina, the way the girl goes up to the house is classic for any composition. I like his lack of color sometimes. I'm sort of drawn to the moody, atmospheric paintings. I like the lack of color. Very taken with Dean Mitchell's work and the way he puts the emotion into the painting. Contemporary, I like Alex Power's work. Love Jean Grafsdorf, the way it glows. And I love Diebenkorn, the way he breaks the rules and puts all the interesting uh, shapes at the edges. I like Rothko, the way he can divide a canvas into two parts, just, you know, two shapes, and he makes it a full composition. I love that. So I guess I'm influenced by a lot of people. In the end, my style isn't like any of them. What is your advice to artists entering shows, and what do you look for as a juror? I know artists coast to coast that would like to be in national shows, would like to have signature memberships, and yet they don't enter. So greatly increases your chances if you enter the show. So that's the first thing I'd like to say about that. The second thing I'd like to say is that we are not necessarily a very good judge of our work. I see artists in my workshops every day that I think paint better than I do. They don't know it. And they say, well, you know, someday when I get good, I'm going to enter a show. I'm like, my gosh, I think you could have taken the top award at the last show I juried. But they don't know that about themselves. So what do you have to lose? It's a few bucks, a little bit of time. And I can tell you, there's something kind of fun about knowing in the back of your mind as the days go on that there's going to be an envelope coming in your mail. Kind of a nice reason to anticipate. Will there be rejection? Of course there will. Have I curled up on the couch and said I'm never painting again? Yes, I have, over and over. Ray will say, oh, she's in the corner in the heap again. She must have got a rejection. So yes, you get rejections. That's how you know your piece wasn't as good as you wanted it to be. Then the other thing I would say about rejections is don't be a heap on the couch. Don't take it personally. Maybe that juror doesn't like that color. Maybe there were too many figurative paintings already in the show and yours didn't make the cut. Maybe they needed a square format and they were all rectangles. You don't even know why a juror is putting together the show that they're putting together. So don't take it personally because I have been rejected from one show and turned around and entered the next show and won an award with the same painting. So don't take it personally. Have fun with it. It's a little bit of a game. So that's what I would say to the person thinking about entering a show. And what do you have to lose? You can't get there if you don't try. As a juror, what I would say is when you look at your work, if you have a good group of art buddies, and everybody should have a good group of art buddies, it's essential. Because only an art buddy understands. Your daughter or son may not understand, your husband or wife may not understand, but your art buddy will know exactly what you're talking about and exactly how you're feeling. If you're in doubt, ask your art buddy, say, here are five paintings, what do you think is the strongest and why? Let them help you figure out how to self-critique. But if you're looking at your work and you're thinking, hmm, what should I enter? The first thing I would recommend you not do is look at the juror and look up their work. Because no juror wants to see a piece come through in their style that's done better than they do. So don't try to second guess the juror. I would say pick the best piece you have at the time and enter it. 
a couple things that are very important to me as a juror. I will see slide after slide after slide, mid-tone painting, mid-tone painting, mid-tone painting, and then here comes somebody who's used really strong contrast. Got strong darks, strong lights, and it just pops right off the screen. That's gonna be the one I'm gonna select. So make sure that it's compositionally strong, that it has good contrast. Then if you already are a pretty good artist and you know the rules and you know that it's pretty good compositionally and all this kind of stuff, then think vision. What would be a little bit different? If I'm looking through slides, floral, 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 antique locks, okay, what is this artist trying to tell me? How does this make it different? Or if you're really good at pattern or you're really good, push whatever you're good at. If you're good with color, make them really sing like a Stephen Quiller. If you're good with uh, intensity colors, do like a Christopher Schenck and really push that intensity color. The work that looks the most like you that's the work that'll get into a show. And think to yourself that that juror might see anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand slides. And if it's a big national show, that juror is going to see that slide for three seconds. Count them. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. Gone. And then, when the whole show is over, what do you think they're going to remember? So, landscape, landscape, floral, barn, portrait, clothespins, landscape, landscape, floral, all the slides are done. You know, I kind of remember that, that thing with the clothespins, that kind of struck me. So a, something a little bit out of the ordinary, something that has a personal vision, that's what I'm looking for as a juror. Is it important to strive to become a signature member in an art organization? I think that depends on where you want to go with your art, what matters to you. I know that when I got my first signature status, I was over the moon because I knew what it meant to me told a couple of my friends, and they're like, that's nice. So it meant maybe absolutely nothing to them. If you want to write a book, teach, be known in the art world, or perform someplace in the art world, signature statuses make a difference. When you read somebody's name and it says AWS, NWS, that says to you, this person has worked hard, they've strived, somebody else has said their work is pretty good. So it becomes sort of an arrival. Much like the educational world, when you get a bachelor degree, that says you have studied for a certain period of time and you're expected to know this amount. So when we get a signature status, we've gotten a little bit of a degree in the art world for that. So I think that they're important if you want to do something with it. And sometimes they're important just for personal satisfaction. Maybe they're important for the value of your paintings. When I got my AWS, then I felt a little more confident to charge a little more for my originals. If you want to get published in a book, it's gonna help if you have a signature status behind your name for the people that are selecting the images. Does it make your art better? Not necessarily. But I can tell you that striving for a signature status will make your art better. It makes you more serious as an artist. It makes you try harder. It makes you study yourself more carefully, study your work more carefully. So if you're a serious artist, I, I think that they're kind of a good thing. How would you suggest looking for a gallery, and how important are galleries? When I first got into my first gallery, I went around my big city that it was nearest to me, and I said, hmm, of all these galleries, this is the one I would like to be in. This is what I think would be the best fit for me. Now, I was totally fortunate because in having all my exhibits, that was one of the galleries that approached me and asked me to be a part of their gallery. So I didn't ever have to go and schlep my stuff over and make my presentation. I think it's a little bit of a mistake to go in and settle for a gallery that's lesser than what you want. I think if you go into a gallery that doesn't represent you well and doesn't have a good reputation, it's gonna be harder for you to raise your prices and it's gonna be harder for you to sell if the artwork around you is not up to your caliber. So from an economic standpoint, I looked at the gallery that had what I thought were the best artists. They had some AWS artists in there. They were commanding the best prices in town. And I knew I would have to sharpen my wit and sharpen my skill level to be able to compete with these other artists in that gallery. So I think that's an important thing. Sometimes artists go into a gallery and then they get better and they wanna raise their prices, but they sort of outgrow their gallery. And then it becomes awkward. Think about it a little bit before you just say yes to the local gallery on the corner because it's going to be an important part of your career as the years go on. So if I select a gallery 
that I fall in love with and they haven't noticed me, what would I do? Okay. I would put together a very nice portfolio and I put together a nice CD and I would call down and find out who the name of the gallery director was. And I would send a very nice letter with a packet, maybe a couple reproductions of magazine articles if I had them or newspaper articles if I was more starting out. I would put together my best resume and it should have an image of a piece of your artwork. It should have a photo of yourself on it, maybe a sentence of a art statement, and then any accolades on the back of it that you have. And when you put together your resume, I recommend that your resume feature your strongest asset. So if you're just a starting out artist and your strongest asset is that you have a bachelor's or a master's in fine art, that should be first. If you're winning national awards, that becomes first and the education moves down the resume. So whatever is your strength, even if you're doing community work, even if you have volunteered and supplied donated work for charities or whatever, if that's your strength, put it first. And whatever it is, don't apologize for it, just put it on there. And a short resume is not necessarily a bad resume. I would put all that together, I'd put some images on a CD, and I would send that off to the gallery director and I would say, here's a sample of my work. I would like to call you in a week and set up a personal appointment. And then I would wait one week, and then I would call and say, hi, I'm Linda Baker. I sent you a packet last week, and I would like to make an appointment to come in and show you a few pieces of my work. I think that's how you're going to get the best results. If you just send the packet with no follow-up, they might say, oh, these are great. And then it gets thrown in the basket and nobody ever looks at them again. So it's really your responsibility as an artist to make that personal contact, make that appointment, and make that follow-up. And if you do that and you get that personal appointment, if they like your work, it's going to be a good fit. Because you've already checked them out, you know you like them, so now it's whether or not they like you and maybe they weren't aware of you. So it's our job to make them aware of us. So that's how I would go about finding a gallery. Linda Baker, it has been great having you here. Thank you so much for coming out to Creative Catalyst and doing a lot of hard work the last couple of days. It's been a pleasure from all of us, so thank you. It is an honor to be here. I will remember this. Thank you. In part one of our two-part interview, Linda talks about the difficulties of defining yourself as a professional artist and explains how she developed an original style. To hear both parts of Linda Baker's interview, check back at the Creative Catalyst blog. Linda Baker's DVD, Layers of Design in Watercolor, is available now at ccpvideos.com.